thank you very much. I'm extremely uh, pleased, honoured to have been asked to address you on a subject which on the surface would seem to be very metaphysical, but which I hope will be seen to be very practical, very much a political issue. And I'd like to begin with a personal reminiscence about Steve Biko, which some of you know, but most of you probably don't know. Namely, the fact that Steve Biko and his comrade, Peter Jones, were arrested on their way, virtually, uh, directly on their way from my house in Cape Town at the time, uh, on their way back uh, home. Both Steve and I uh, were at the time under house arrest, and for a number of reasons, we won't go into the details now, some of them are very poignant reasons, some of them are reasons uh, <clears throat> which have to do with a lot of personal regret. For a number of reasons, we actually didn't meet each other. The important point is that Steve was on a mission uh, in order to help various uh, groups of people in the country at the time, all of it underground as you can imagine, to unite the liberation movement, uh, both in inside the country as well as outside the armed movements outside the country. That was the mission. There was another mission as well, but this was a central issue. And I, I like to say always when I think back of this particular time that Steve died literally in pursuit of the unity of the people uh, of South Africa, of Azania. And I think it's something that we should really try to remember. That, that death wasn't only unnecessary, brutal and all the rest of it, but it was a death, it was a martyrdom in the sacrifice for the unity of the liberation movement. And what we see today in this country is really a mockery of that. Now, it's very difficult to speak after the two, my two predecessors, not only because of the rousing, stimulating, thought-provoking content and the way in which they carried this across, but also because they've stolen most of my speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, in one sense, it's going to be fairly easy for me to um, say what I need to say and what I wish to say. But I want to stress that my intention is to look at the big picture and to try to provide, if possible, a kind of GPS to try to see where we're actually heading and whether we can reach that destination, that glittering prize of which Asha spoke just now. I think when we look at the present situation, we see that we are faced with a ruling party that's firmly entrenched, but one that is fracturing for a number of reasons, which we don't have the time to go into detail about. And even though there are many different class interests that are vying for dominance within the ANC, it's clear that the objective fact is that because the ANC, like similar ruling parties throughout the world which have made similar compromises for similar reasons, that the ANC is locked into a paradigm of rule that is determined by neoliberal economic orthodoxy across the world, something which Diapolo spoke about earlier in some detail. That, if one wants to reduce it, reduce it to a simple statement, that paradigm of rule is uh, informed largely by the need for essentially foreign direct investment and the maximization of exports. And because the ANC as a ruling party is locked into that paradigm of rule, no matter what it says, no matter what it does, no matter who says what in the NC, that's what counts. The strategic positions are held by international and national capital in this country. There's no question about it. Anyone who tries to tell you anything else is talking nonsense. Now, all this is happening in a climate, international economic climate, 
which is as close to a deep going recession, an imminent, in fact, some people say, the United States has been in recession for the last year, but they simply haven't acknowledged this. An international, worldwide recession, which means for any belief that an export-led uh, development in this country is going to save us economically is a pipe dream. And we can see that. You know, the latest uh, economic statistics from the Reserve Bank demonstrate very clearly that things are going down and they're going to stay down for a long time. Just to round off this picture, because I don't want to go into the economic uh, issues, to some extent, the Apollo has already done that. But just to round it off, I want to say that on a worldwide level, there is, of course, a counter-dynamic emerging in the South-South cooperation that we, in our country, largely associate with BRICS, Brazil, uh, India, China, South Africa, and generally Indonesia, there are other countries of the South which are beginning to uh, increase the possibility of more space, as it were, for independent sovereign states uh, that may be able to get more space uh, to leverage more power, as it were, on a world level uh, from those who have in the past dominated mainly the North, mainly Europe, mainly the North, North America, Australia, and so on. The second point I want to make briefly is that the real beneficiaries of the Compromise of 1994 are, of course, besides the white capitalist class, and that has been stated very, very clearly by my predecessors, besides the white capitalist class, who now have open sesame across the whole African continent, something they never had before, who have open sesame across the entire world, and indeed, many, many previously specifically South African companies have become multinational in that sense. So besides that class, the real beneficiaries have been the rising black middle class, even if it is a higher purchase middle class, a middle class that from to the, overnight can, can, be, uh, can topple back, as it were, into the proletariat. Now, I don't want to go into, that, into detail on that. All I want to say is that it's crucial to understand the value system of that middle class, because that's where the leadership of the country is coming from today. And the fact, and again, my predecessors have made this point, the fact that that middle class has become so degenerate in its value system, has forgotten what it is that we fought for, how we fought for it, how we suffered for it, that fact is part of the problem, why we can't turn the ship of state around to face in a totally different direction. And that's what I want to address. That's what I mean by the politics of truth. When we look at your position to the ruling party, very briefly, besides the DA, which is clearly and openly a party of capital, you've got COPE, you've got the IFP, you've got the UDM, and you've got a few other smaller groups. And all of these are no-hope parties. All of them are, are divided, fractured, etc., etc., and they're all fracturing and dividing for very simple reason. Same reason as in the ANC, namely the fact that from a past which was informed by a struggle for a true humanity, from a past that was informed by that struggle, they now have to accustom themselves to a neoliberal barbarism, the brutality of, uh, I think uh, uh, Alan was saying earlier, uh, I can, I, I want forget how you put it, but basically a, a, a philosophy that says I am the purpose of all life. I am what it's all about. You give me, and I might give you back, but I just, I'm not uh, obliged to. <laughs> now, that's, the, that's the, the struggle in these parties. And that is why those who have a modicum of decency in them are falling away from these parties, are splitting away going back to where they came from, either uh, dying away, as it were, or doing some small uh, enterprise stuff. So all these parties, there are no hope parties. I mean, let's not, you know, let's not beat about the bush. Uh, they can't become neoliberal parties, or rather they want to become neoliberal parties. Most of them are either going to end up, as the IDP did, inside the DA, or they're going to end up inside the ANC, which is virtually the same thing today. Uh, 
However, the aura of liberation continues to give a credibility to the ANC, which it deserves, let's face it, which it deserves, it was the main stream of the liberation struggle. There's no question about that. And it, it gives it the, um, or the, the dominance that uh, it has. And that is the reason why the most effective opposition today is inside the ANC, not outside. Why the Kosatus, the Communist Party and other elements inside the ANC are more effective than the DA or the IFP or any of the others. Um, however, and here I'm giving a benefit of the doubt to the leadership of this in, inner party uh, opposition, as I say, I believe that their attempt to move the ANC leftwards, and I give the benefit of the doubt, I, I'm suggesting that they actually believe they can do this, to move it leftwards, to turn it into a socialist movement, as they say. I believe this is just, you know, quixotic. It's Don Quixote. It's, it's, it's jousting at windmills. It's not going to happen, to put it simply. These guys are going to be shifted aside one of these days. Hopefully not in the brutal way that is happening in other countries, where the communists were literally liquidated by the capitalist class inside these parties. If you think back of uh, Indonesia, those of you who know your history will remember, almost a million communists were simply decimated for the very same sort of reasons. So, you know, it's, it's time for these people also, by the way, to wake up and to smell the coffee, as they say. We also have, and I think we need to be quite honest about this again, uh, I think Asha spoke to this briefly, there is a global dilemma of the left. The credibility of post-capitalist societies, of socialism, the credibility of socialism went with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because in the eyes of most human beings on the, on the planet, the Soviet Union was actually existing socialism. Whether we liked it on the left or not, but that's what the, social, what the people believed. And when the, social, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, socialism, the credibility of socialism collapsed. Of course, it doesn't mean that socialism, a revolution, and so on, as uh, Asha said, that these things have had their day. Far from it. The point is to find a way back into that way of thinking, into that way of acting, to find a way that is more appropriate to the times. Uh, we can't continue talking, you know, in the language of the 19th century. We've got to find a new language, we've got to find a new set of metaphors in order to get people to understand what the truth really is. Unless you want to be fatalistic and you say that human beings are greedy by nature, human beings are brutal, do domineering, etc. by nature, all of which of course is not true. You know, people die for other people and that alone, whether you're a soldier or whether you're a mother of a child that's uh, uh, threatened by death and you're willing to die for that child you're willing to die for your uh, fellow soldier, it disproves any idea that human beings are simply greedy, self-centered, etc., etc. There is no such thing. Human beings are as pliable, as labile as anything else. And that's what we need to believe. That's where we need to start. Now, I just want to say very briefly, why are we talking about truth in this setup? And I think the, the simple answer is, and it, it links to something that the Apollo was saying earlier, but almost from the other side, so to speak. She said we must recapture the state. I also believe that. But I believe that power is all over. I believe, and it's, it's a title of a book, that we can change the world without taking power. Without taking power. We need to find, when I say without taking power, I mean without capturing the state. But I also want to, to, to contradict myself by saying by, that by changing the world, we're actually capturing the state. I want to get to that point very briefly now. How are we going to do this? As I see it, and there are a few attempts in South Africa at the moment and in other parts of the world as well, but in South Africa at the moment, there are a few attempts to get people once again to believe as it were, from below, to get people to believe in the credibility and the viability of struggle 
against the capitalist system, to believe that there is an alternative, not as Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative. We, we've got to get out of that mindset. We've got to find out how do we get to the point where people once again believe that there is an alternative and are prepared in the passionate way that we all were prepared to fight against apartheid capitalism, to fight against post-apartheid capitalism. With the same passion, with the same total commitment uh, which people like Steve Biko, amongst many others, demonstrated in their lives and through their death. It's about getting people, the masses of our people, to understand what's actually happening in the country. Revealing, and in some cases exposing, the truth so that people can see that they have the power to change things. This is what it's really about. That's why we talk about the politics of truth. It's about accountability. It's about deepening democracy. It's about, and some people are doing this at an official level, the public protector, for example, is exposing a whole lot of things that need to be exposed. But we need to get people to understand, for example, that big firms pay uh, something like, uh, I think it's a fifth, if not uh, less, a fifth for electricity per unit than what an ordinary household pays. Why is this so? Because capital reigns supreme. Because foreign direct investment is essential. So you want to give them electricity at a very cheap rate, but you're asking the poorest of the poor to pay five, six, seven times more than they pay per unit of electricity. It's that kind of truth that we need to expose people to, that we need, we need to expose to people so that they can say, look, we're not prepared to do this. We are citizens. We have the power. We made 1994 possible, and we're not going to allow this uh, to continue. That's what it's about. It's about, as I say, um, accountability, about deepening democracy, about getting public participation as citizens in the politics uh, of our country. I believe that we still have time to redirect the ship of state. I was laughing at uh, Alan saying about uh, the uh, Enterprise, uh, the, the Star Trek, and so on. Because I was thinking to myself that actually the, the metaphor that we should have in our mind is that the ship of state, you know, it's a ship of fools. There's a famous story about the ship of fools. It's a ship of fools, and we've got to turn this blooming thing around. Um, we've got to make sure that we're not just shifting the, the deck chairs or the Titanic, so to speak. We've got to point it in a different direction. We've got to get to that horizon, the distant, glittering prize, that horizon. We've got to get back there somehow. This is what it's all about, and that's how we need to see it. The question is, can we do it? If you believe that you can only do it if you get control of the state, you're lost. You've got to do it from below. You've got to get people to understand that when they, create, when they form a neighborhood watch, this is on the more negative side, when they form a neighborhood watch or a community watch, they are empowering themselves. When they, when they establish a reading club, a community reading club in a poor community where households don't have books, don't have literate parents, don't have people who have the time to take an interest in the education of their children, when they form a community reading club, they are empowering themselves, they are empowering the entire community. When they form a cooperative, a bulk buying club, etc., etc., there are many different ways in which people can and, in fact, do empower themselves. But we've got to make this systematic, we've got to coordinate it. It's got to become a movement. That's what the truth is about. It's about both exposing what's really going on so that people can realize, my goodness, why do we believe in these characters? Why do we believe in these self serving, self centered, greedy people? We can empower ourselves. That's what we must do. So it's not simply lamenting, complaining, condemning. It's about empowering, about doing things yourself, taking charge uh, of your own lives. And there's a lot of pressure on us to do this. As I said, there are many different attempts in South Africa. One of them is a truth conference, which a year ago came together in this uh, city in order to consider how we can get out of this trap in which we find ourselves. And I believe that things like the truth conference, processes like the truth conference are the way to go. That's the way we're going to empower ourselves. We're going to make information available to the public on all kinds of issues 
what's really going on in education? Why is education in such a mess? Why is the public health service in such a mess? Why is the energy uh, the delivery of energy such a huge problem when it shouldn't be? And so on and so forth. Why are there no jobs? These are the questions. We need to expose the truth. So the people, you know, I always say the intellectuals are not people who go to universities. Intellectuals are people who understand how society is structured and how society works. That's what an intellectual really is. You don't have to have a degree to become an intellectual. So I'm saying that we need to make it possible for people to see that they have the power to change things. And this is what it's about. We need to find the leadership. We need to find the, what now in modern parlance, I don't even know what it really means. Uh, you need to find the sort of things that are that, what they call game-breaking activities. I don't know what game-breaking means, but I'm sure you do. Uh, <laughs> You've got to find that sort of thing so that we can get out of this trap and actually look in a different direction altogether. And by the way, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not suggesting it should be anti-government, anti-ANC, anything like that. There are people inside the ANC, inside government and outside who are equally committed to what I'm saying here. I want you to understand that. We need to find, we need to get together those people who belong together. The problem is that people, because of patronage, because of fear of losing your job, people are doing things that normally in their, in their decent hours in the evening they would never think of doing. But they're doing them because they're scared of losing their jobs, because of this element, this environment, this atmosphere of fear, which is once again ruining our lives in this country. And it's not just a fear of crime and the fear of criminals and, and you know people who break into your house and rape your daughter or whatever they do. It's not just that. It's the fear of being eliminated, being sidelined, being made poor overnight, being ridiculed, and all the rest of it. The dysfunctional local and provincial states, places like the Eastern Cape, Pumalanga, and so on, and many other examples, these are things that we need to explain to people why this is so. I, I, I have much more to say, but I think my time is up. I should uh, come to an end. I think that we need to be clear that what we want to do is to demonstrate the possibility of an alternative. I've given examples of what we can begin to do. We need a movement. It's got to become a movement of the people that will put pressure on government to behave in the way we wanted them. You know, the Husanas, the orchestra, <laughs> all the stuff that Apollo was speaking about when we voted in 1994. We need to put that kind of pressure on government. And if government cannot deliver, let us then do what, I, what Asha said. Let us have the courage to say, in that case, we've got to get rid of government. We've got to do that. Nobody today, you know, we live in a democracy. We've got Uhuru, even if we haven't got Ubuntu. We're living in a democracy. We must exploit every possible legal angle to get to the things that we want. Every possible legal angle. Nobody here is saying, you know, let's preach violence, let's preach uh, revolution, etc. Uh, today. Let us go as far as we can, and if the day arises when we have to, I will be in the forefront, I can tell you, when the day arises when we have to say, let's overthrow this lot, as we did sometime before. Empowerment and self-organization of the urban and the rural poor as far as I'm concerned, is what it's about. We've got to make it clear, and that is why we've got the gift, as it were, of being in the middle class. We've got the gift of being educated formally, of having access to books, to information, and so on, is to make it possible for those who don't, as I say, the urban and the rural poor, to be empowered. It's our task, it's our duty. We've got to expose that truth. That truth is what will liberate. The truth, as it says, shall set you free. Thank you very much.